It's me, Professor Gloop, the big on science guy. Today, we continue learning about electricity. Come on, come on. You are going on a trip with me in my time machine. We are going to find out the history of energy. Since the beginning of civilization, man has used fire as a source of energy to do many things. Yep, fire was the means by which forests were cleared to make way for new settlements and the planting of crops for agriculture. The people at that time, geez, they do not look very much like us, do they? Well, they used fire to brighten the darkness of the night and they used it to cook their food. Uh-oh, this guy is going to need a really big fire. However, as time went on and people became smarter, other sources of energy were discovered. The most important being electricity. You know, electricity made life easier and more comfortable for everyone. It became easier to light up dark areas and because there was electricity, people began to invent appliances and machines that worked on electricity. Okay, that was the world. What about electricity here in Malaysia? The history of electricity in Malaysia started as early as 1894 in Rawang, Selangor. Two well-known taukes from the mining industry, Lok Yu and Tambu Sami Pile, were among the first to use electric generators to pump water at tin mines in Rawang, Selangor. In May 1896, the National Railway's main station in Kuala Lumpur became the first public building in the country to be lit by electricity. On the 4th of July 1900, Another power station began operating in Rao Pahang. It was owned by the Rao Australian Gold Mining Company. Um, what about Penang, the Pearl of the Orient? Well, its first experience with electricity was on the 14th of July 1904. This was when the Sungai Pinang Electrical Power Station was opened. 15 households and businesses and 41 street lamps in Penang were lit. Kuala Lumpur was the second location in the country that received electricity after Penang. Electricity was generated from the hydroelectric power station in Ulu Gomba, about 20 kilometers from Kuala Lumpur. A number of business premises and living quarters for government officials were among the first to receive electric power. On the 11th of February 1920, August Huttenbach was issued a license and awarded a huge contract to supply electricity to Sebrang Prai in the state of Penang. Electricity lighted up Sarawak in 1921. That was after Raja Sir Charles Vinerbrook ordered the construction of an electrical power station. It used coal to generate electricity. Whew! That's a lot of power stations! But that isn't the end of our history lesson yet! 
on the 5th of July 1927, an electric power station began operating in Bangsa, Kuala Lumpur. Then, in 1929, a hydroelectric power station was opened in Chendero, Perak. Power stations here, power stations there. So, who is going to look after all that electricity that is being produced? Who is going to regulate prices, take care of repairs and make sure the lights come on again after a blackout? Well, the Central Electricity Board of the Federation of Malaya, popularly known as the CEB, was given the job to do it. It was set up on the 1st of September 1949. Malaysia became independent from the British on the 31st of August 1957. With independence came modernization and progress in many facets of life in Malaya. That was what our country was called then, not Malaysia. M A L A Y A Malaya. And there was no stopping the expansion of the supply of electricity throughout the country after that. The government wanted to make sure that everyone enjoyed its benefits. Let's learn more about electricity. Let's see. Um, oh yes. The Sultan Salahuddin Abdul Aziz Electric Power Station. It is located in Kapa Klang and is the largest thermal energy power station in Malaysia. This power station is equipped with a jetty to facilitate the unloading of coal. Let's take a look at what these people are doing. Aha! They are workers on the jetty unloading coal from incoming ships. And what are they going to do with it? Well, they place the coal on conveyor belts to be taken to the coal field. And where does it go to after that? I think it is taken to a storage facility or bunker slots where it is processed to reduce dampness. These are the coal bunkers that are found at the station. Anyway, the coal is not going to stay in the bunker slots forever. It has to go somewhere else. From the bunkers, the coal is channeled through feeders to a grinder. It is then sent through pipes to a furnace for the burning process. During this process, the heat that is given out will heat up the air and produce steam. The steam causes the turbines to turn, resulting in the rotation of the generator. The coal that has been finely ground is full of chemical energy. So, when it is placed in the furnace to be burned, it releases heat energy. The heat energy will heat up the water in the pipes until it turns to steam. Steam has potential energy and is able to rotate the turbines. When the turbines begin to turn, they produce kinetic energy, which gets the generator going to produce electricity. Gas, which has chemical energy, is then sprayed into the burning chamber. The rotating compressor sucks in air through the openings. 
The air is then compressed and pumped into the burning chamber. The mixture of fuel and air burns and produces energy. The hot gas expands and the potential energy that is released turns the turbines. When the turbines rotate, they produce kinetic energy, which is needed to rotate the generator to produce electricity. You know, whenever something is burned, it leaves behind waste products. And that also happens here at the Sultan Salahuddin Abdul Aziz Electrical Power Station. So, what is left behind? Well, there's smoke and coal dust. And how does the station deal with the smoke? Well, the smoke is first filtered to reduce pollutants and is then expelled through very tall chimneys about 175 meters high. Ooh, that is really tall! And the dust? Well, it's collected and taken to a storage container and then it is sold. To whom? To factories that make cement. And when this dust is mixed with lime and clay, we get cement powder that is of a higher and better quality. The ash pond? The ash pond? Hmm, what happens there? Oh yes, the water that overflows from the ash pond is directed out to the deep blue sea. Don't worry about it. It is clean and will not pollute the sea. And do you know why the Sultan Salahuddin Abdul Aziz Electrical Power Station makes sure that the sea is kept clean? Well, it is because the station needs clean sea water. That's right! The station pumps clean water from the sea to cool the steam it uses to produce electricity. The steam is cooled but the seawater now becomes hot. Jeez, so what do they do with the hot seawater? They send it back to the sea using canals or big and long drains. So, as the hot seawater travels along, it cools down again. So, when it reaches the sea, there is no threat of thermal pollution and all the sea plants and creatures will be safe. Let's talk about hydroelectric generators. A hydroelectric generator uses water power to turn its turbines. And just how do we get this power? Well, the potential energy from water is harnessed by building dams across a river or stream high up on a hill or mountain to stop the water from flowing. Do you know the names of any dams? I do. The Jaw Dam in Cameron Highlands. This is one good example of how water is used to generate electricity. Water from this dam has also been used by the Sultan Idris Electric Power Station in, where else, Cameron Highlands. The Sultan Idris Electric Power Station's hydroelectric generators are placed under the ground. So, if you want to see them, you will have to go through an underground tunnel that is one kilometer long. A long, long walk. A good way to train for the Olympics, though. Okay, let's see how the force of water energy produces electricity in a hydroelectric station. You ready? Okay, potential energy of water turns the turbines, which in turn turns the shaft. 
the shaft then turns the rotor that is found inside the generator and voila, you get electricity. The electricity that is produced by the generators is carried by cables to the transformer hall. And if you are wondering what a transformer is, well, it is a device to raise or lower the voltage of an alternating current. And that's not the end of the story yet. The water that is collected in the dam has potential energy that will change to kinetic energy when it is pumped through the tunnels to the power station. The energy from the water will rotate the turbines and generate kinetic energy which will cause the generator to rotate to produce electricity. Phew! Simple, isn't it? <laughs> So, where does the electricity go once it has been produced? To the surface, of course. Yep, that's right. From the transformer to the cables and whoosh, to the surface. And then what? Well, it is channeled to an area called the switch zone. The switch zone, in turn, sends the high voltage supply of electricity through high tension cables that are hooked to very high towers. We call these towers pylons. These giant structures form a network across the country and is called the National Grid Network. It is these National Grid Networks that distribute electricity to the whole country and that's how you, yes, you, get electricity at home. Coming back to power stations. Did you know that most thermal or hydroelectric power stations generate alternating currents at 20 kilovolts? Of course you didn't know that. You're not supposed to know that because if you did, I'd be out of a job. <laughs> Just kidding. After that, the voltage of the alternating current is raised by the step-up transformer to a staggering 275 kilovolts. This is done to minimize the loss of electricity as it travels over long distances. The switch zone will channel this high voltage supply through the national grid networks. The huge high tension cables or power lines strung from the pylons will carry the electricity to the main substations. Okay, don't fall asleep just yet, there's more! At the main substations, the voltage is lowered by the step-down transformer to 240 volts for use at home or 415 volts for industrial use. Okay, up till now, I've told you quite a lot about electricity. Just a word of warning, our reserves of coal and gas are not going to last forever. They may become depleted one day. Who knows, maybe even water may become difficult to find. So we need to find other forms of energy. And now scientists are looking at what is called renewable energy. That would include energy that we get from the sun, the wind, and even waves that roll on the sea. Hmm, I guess since sunshine is plentiful, it would be the best candidate for renewable energy. The energy from the sun is called solar energy. It can be used to produce electricity. Scientists have developed solar cells for this purpose. 
A solar cell is a piece of equipment for producing electric power from sunlight. Um, so, what does it do? Well, it captures sunlight on a bright sunny day and generates electricity for everyday use. Got it? No? Okay, here are some examples. The solar water pump and the buoy that floats on the sea to mark safe or dangerous spots. Both of them can be powered by electricity generated from sunshine. Actually, solar energy can do more than that. It can be used to light up street lamps and even whole houses. Woo-wee! Sunshine! Sunshine! Solar energy! Electricity! What would we do without it? It's magical, isn't it? Just stand at the window and look outside at the world after the sun goes down. Everything you see is the work of electricity. The bright lights, the colorful ones, the ones that run and chase each other and spin and twinkle. It's all because man is able to generate electricity. In fact, electricity is the reason why we have life after dark. It keeps us safe and comfortable. It also allows us to do many of the things that we could not find the time to do in the daytime. Life is beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> So, that's it for electricity. Remember, electricity is a wonderful friend, but a terrible enemy. Always be careful when you handle electrical equipment. Never touch them with wet hands. Never try and repair electrical circuits or equipment unless you have been trained. One more thing before I sign off. Save electricity. Turn off lights and electrical appliances when you are not using them. Waste not, want not. Bye!